It might be a surprise to you, but you didn't come to church today. Paul says in Romans 16, greet the church that assemble uh, greet the church that assembles in the house of so and so. So he's not so the church that meets in their home. So the church, the ecclesia, is not a building, but it is the congregation. And and I ask us to change the seating order today, just that we can see each other and see who the congregation is, who the church is. So today's message is about you. Today's message is about me and about all of us. We'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 12 to 27 For as the body is one and has many members and all the members of that one body being many are one body so also is Christ For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body whether we be Jews or Gentiles whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it has pleased him. And if there were all of one member, where were the body? But now are there many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the hand to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part, part with, uh, which lacketh that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. While one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. Amen. Let us pray at the beginning of the message. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come here together and celebrate you Lord Jesus, celebrate your life, your death and your resurrection, celebrate that you are victorious and that you rule, and we celebrate that you established your body, the church here on earth to bring glory to you Lord Jesus. And so we pray that this, uh, as we dig into your word today, that it might be a blessing to us and glorifying to you. In your son's name we pray, Amen. So the church of Corinth, to give you a little bit of a context, was a, a bustling business hub. It was a port city, it was a multicultural city, a multi-ethnical city. Corinth was a melting, melting pot of, of religions and spirituality. And so in many senses it was, it's very similar to Vienna or also to the chapel. Not the melting pot of religions but of <laughs> cultures. Um, so when Paul writes the, the letter that we call the first letter to the Corinthians, he writes it to uh, approximately 18 months old church. He just left and he addresses some of the questions that the church has, but in the same process he also addresses some of the things that he heard were going wrong in the church. And it's a, it is a deeply personal letter because you really feel how, how Paul um, strives to uh, that the church lives to its full potential but also all the contents even though it's personal are valid for us today as he says for example in chapter 11 and 14 he always says what I'm writing here I write is valid in all the churches 
And then chapters, the chapter 12 we're in today, and also the chapter 13 that most of you know, the, the chapter of love, these chapters are actually side notes to, to, to the greater context that he starts in chapter 12 actually, where he tries to explain the spiritual gifts and the proper use of these gifts in the church. And because there has been a lot of uh, misuse and abuse of these gifts in the church, he has to explain now how they have, can be properly used within the body of Christ. And if we go to verse 12, the first verse that we read, we see that Paul says, well, he compares the, the church of Christ with the human body. There are many members, but it's still one. We have one, two, not three arms, but uh, so we have many, many members and everything um, consists, uh, makes up the whole body. And he says in the same way, this is a picture of Christ. In verse 13, he, he speaks about that we are all baptized into one body, whether we are Jews or Gentiles, bond or free, and we have been made to drink into one spirit. And he says here, we, he addresses the congregation he's writing to, but he also addresses himself. And he says, so basically, if you have been baptized into Christ, if you are buried with Christ in baptism, if you have been raised up again and have been given the Holy Spirit, then that we also means you. And so ethnicity or background doesn't matter. If you were a slave or free, um, or where you come from, you, you become one body. But now it gets complicated because he says the, the body is not one member, but many. And here, reading through that, I saw that in verse 14, he says, one body and many members, and then he goes on, and then later in verse 20, he actually changes the order around and says, many parts, one body. And I think he tries to get at the point from different angles to really hit it home. And so if we look at the verses 15 to 19, are which I think he addresses the first aspect of that. Um, he's talking about body members that are saying, well, I am not the hand. Uh, the foot says, I'm not the hand, so obviously I'm not the body. Or the, the ear says, well, I'm not the eye, so I'm not of the body. So, and this is also I think here's where the devil tries to get get in and and discourage us because we he says well you're not really the thing that you wish you would be so actually you're not you're nothing you're not no part of the whole thing um, but that's not true and I think a lot of time when we look at it this way I am not that part or I'm not that part jealousy can creep in. Uh, regarding spiritual gifting, regarding ministry, or whatever it is. Because, like, these cool gifts, or these perceived cool gifts, are not the ones we have. And jealousy can be expressed in, in two ways. On the one hand, it's like, I want it too, so I want to be at the same level. And if that fails, if you don't get that, then it's like, okay, you shouldn't have it in the first place anyways. And... And James addresses that um, in, in the fourth chapter, verses 2 and 3, where he says, you have not because you ask not. So it's allowed to ask for things. But then, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. So he says, you're asking with the wrong attitude. With what attitude do you want to receive these other gifts? Um, and in the, in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul says, If there is envy, strife, and division among you, you are caught carnal and walk as men. So even though we, we might be tempted, or the devil tries to tempt us to be jealous of other people who have giftings that 
or serving the church in a way that we think we want to do as well. Um, instead of being that, we should rejoice with our brother, rejoice with our sister. Uh, like it says in Romans 12, 15, rejoice with them that rejoice. And if we read through Paul's letters, he, he always says, I, I give thanks to God every time I think about you. And I think also because of the, the gifting that uh, the people he writes it to have. And I said before, it's, it's not wrong to, to ask, it's actually encouraged. Uh, but the question always is how and why? Are we asking for our own glory or are we asking for God's, like we read in, in James 4? And I think it's, it's right to ask for God to use us also in places where there's a lack in the kingdom, where workers are actually necessary. I heard of a story about a very famous preacher, in the, at least in the state or in this area, and there was a convention and he was invited as one of the top speakers. And they were looking for him and couldn't find him. And eventually they, they found him working, cleaning the toilets and working in the kitchen. And it's like, the people came from you, for you to, to hear you speak. Why are you now doing these kind of tasks? And he said, well, there are many other preachers here. They're doing a great job, but I saw they needed some help here. So I thought my work is better used here. So, And I really love that. Um, that story because it shows the, the attitude we can have when we see ourselves as members of the body we really we want to work in areas where there is a lack for God's glory. So we have seen that we can replace jealousy with thankfulness for, for the tasks that the brothers and sisters are doing and how God blessed them. But how about if we are the, the gifted uh, person? What's what pitfall can we fall into? And Paul says here in the, in the verses 20 to 21, he says basically we can fall into boastfulness or pride. He, um, he speaks about that, that we can have the attitude that we say, well, we don't need you, you're too weak, you're un too unworthy, and and so you're not really part of the body. And I think exactly that was also what was kind of happening in the church in Corinth. And for that reason, Paul wrote the, the 13th chapter, where he says in verse 4, he says, okay, to so those guys, love does not envy, it does not boast, it, does, it is not proud. And I would like to turn with you to Romans chapter 12, which is a parallel passage to the, to the whole body topic. And in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 3, the author says, For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. So we shouldn't think too high of ourselves. God has uh, placed us somewhere, or it says here, He has dealt with us according to His measure. So we shouldn't think too high of ourselves, but at the same time, we shouldn't also think too low of ourselves. So there are always two sides. One body, many members, many members, one body. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So for a company to function, different tasks must be done by various people. And the same is for the body. For my body to function, all my organs have to fulfill different tasks. And in the next verse, this is how it compares the, the church uh, to, to the body, to our body. So we being many are one body in Christ and every member one of another. And in the next verses he gives examples how this can look like. How can, can all people be, be one body and members of one another? And so for example in verses 6 to 8 
right? So it's having the gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. With a prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith or ministry. Let us wait on our ministry. Or he that teaches on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And I think the, the great beauty in this passage is that there's a, there's a task for everyone in the kingdom. Somebody once said there's no unemployment in the house of the Lord. And, and here in Romans we're encouraged to do whatever God has given us with the full potential that we have. And we can serve according to the grace that He has given us. And if we turn back to, to chapter 12 of the book of Corinthians, verses 21 to 25, we see that every person, every member of the body is necessary, every member is worthy, every mem member is honorable. And he says, especially the less representable parts. For example, my kidney, I don't spend much time thinking about my kidney. Um, rather, probably we would think about our face, our hair, our biceps, whatever it is. But, but nevertheless, we are super happy that our kidney is working. And it's important that, that it is working. Um, and similar, it's very similar to the church because he says here there are some, some members um, who he says are, we, th we think are less honorable, like the kidney, inside, stored away, doing its task. But actually, if that kidney is removed, or that lung is removed, or that liver, we have a serious problem. And so it is in the church. And, and that's why we shouldn't look down on anyone. Um, but then actually put all of that into practice. And the way Paul says we can put this into practice of uh, not looking down on other people or being thankful for, for our brothers and sisters is caring for one another. Um, and I repeat verse 25, that there should be no division in the body, but, the, but that the members should have the same care for one another. So if your throat is hurting, would you care? If your brother is hurting, would you care? If your stomach is cramping, would you care? Or if your sister is in trouble, would you care? And most of us would probably say, yes, of course we would. And if not, we definitely have something to work and to pray about. But I think it's also important that we're not only there for brothers and sisters in the bad times, when some, somebody is hurting or in trouble, but we should also be there in the good times because relationships are formed over a series, uh, over a series of time. So, so my question is, do you, know, do you know somebody here, maybe you can look at the person and see somebody who you can care for. Is there a person you think it would be good to, to give them a call next week? Or, or to say, hey, let's meet up, let's see, how are you doing spiritual, spiritual? Uh, how can I pray for you? And, and I think that is one of the, the core parts of being together, is having this fellowship of strengthening, because why is it, okay, why, why next week? Why should we call somebody next week? Why can't we wait a month or maybe half a year? We're also busy, we have our jobs and families. But in 1 Peter, in verse, uh, 1 Peter 5, verse 8, Peter says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeing whom he may devour. So the enemy is walking around like a roaring lion, and he's looking at whom he can devour. And what if the enemy will try to attack your brother or your sister 
next week, and not in half a year when we have time. Who will care for them next week? In ecology, they say that, that animals walking hurts to protect themselves from the enemy. So exactly like the, the animals on the on the, the plane somewhere, they're in these groups because they want to the chance of being eaten by a lion is less likely. But we as a church are also a herd, mostly a sheep herd, shepherd, shepherd, but because sheep are not so intelligent animals. Um, but but we, we are members of Christ's herd, of Christ's flock. And the important message is concerning also that the passage from 1 Peter is like, don't be that animal that is on the fringe of the herd. Because these are the ones that the predators like to attack. The wolves will scout and see where's the one that strays a little bit here, a little bit there, and then next time they got it. And so if we, we have to consider ourselves as, as members of the body and we want to run this race and we want to uh, receive the crown of, of glory and victory, and so the best way to do that is to go through the, through the herd and say, sorry, 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 I want to be in the middle where there's protection, where everybody else is. But also, if you're in the middle, if you're uh, involved in, in life groups, in ministries, if you're meeting with brothers and sisters, at the same time we have to watch out for those who are at the side, who have not realized the, the danger that is there on being on the side of the herd. And we can pull them into the middle with love. And, and as the final verse, and with that I actually want to conclude and kind of make a short summary and uh, give us some uh, take-home lessons. Now we are the body of Christ and members in particular. So we are the body of Christ and members in particular. And I think it's... I couldn't have invented uh, the church and I think like Petra said earlier, it's a, it's a wonderful mystery that we, can, uh, that we can only experience God in some aspects in unity. And that is why this body is so important and we are all members. And everyone has a task. Uh